Welcome to lecture four on the nervous system. In this video, I'm going to introduce you to the gross anatomy of the central nervous system, particularly the brain. In video five, we'll look in more detail at the structure of the brain. And then in the last video, number six, we'll look at uh, the spinal cord, which is part of the central nervous system, and at the peripheral nervous system. So remember that there are two major divisions of the nervous system, the central nervous system, which includes the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, uh, which includes cranial and spinal nerves, as well as the sensory receptors. If different names for structures, um, if they exist in the peripheral nervous system versus the central nervous system. So if you have a group of axons that are running together, they are associated with blood vessels wrapped with some connective tissue. If you're in the central nervous system, that kind of structure is called a tract. If you're in the peripheral nervous system, it's referred to as a nerve. But in both cases, you have bundles of axons. Now, the reason they're bundled is because they are coming from the same place and then potentially going to similar locations once they get in the general vicinity of where they're going. You get smaller and smaller bundles. There's also a difference for what you call groups of cell bodies in the central versus the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, a group of cell block bodies is called a nucleus. And you can recognize them, although it takes a little practice. This is, these are really obvious ones um, that, I'm, that I'm circling here. So there are some sort of less obvious ones that you learn to recognize. So it's a group of cell bodies in the central nervous system is called a nucleus. If we're in the peripheral nervous system, that same structure or same kind of structure is referred to as a ganglion. And that may seem silly because, again, it's a group of, of neuron soma, but it actually does allow us to, at a glance, tell are we talking about the central or peripheral nervous system. This is an example of a, a ganglion in the somatic peripheral nervous system referred to as the dorsal root ganglion. Uh, and that's uh, something we'll be talking more about in the context of spinal cord. This slide is just to remind you of the overall functions of the nervous system to carry out what we call higher mental functions um, of this list, thought, emotion, language, decision making, memory, attention. The only one that isn't displayed by non-human animals is true language. So we share a lot with our cousins in the animal world. The nervous system also integrates and controls not just the movement of our bodies, but um, the activity of a lot of different body systems. And then finally, the nervous system is um, co-chair of homeostasis along with the endocrine system. And it has a really important difference from the endocrine system in the sense that it's the only body system that allows us to get any sort of input about what's happening in the world around us. In order to execute those functions, you need to be able to take in information. And that involves receptors that carry information into the central nervous system by generating action potentials that travel along nerves, which are part of the peripheral nervous system, and then into the central nervous system. 
the brain and the spinal cord. The next thing that necessarily has to happen is that information has to be processed and integrated with what our brains already know of the world. Finally, an output is generated. If it's a motor output, the central nervous system signals are going to go out through peripheral nervous system to muscles and glands. Um, if it's thought, then the signals will remain within the central nervous system. Each of these different jobs of the nervous system takes place in a slightly different part of our nervous system's functions in the nervous system, as well as different locations. So we have the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord sitting up here. The rest of this concept map is showing us different parts of the peripheral nervous system. Now, remember when we initially talked about homeostasis, uh, we talked about the afferent and efferent pathways, and I told you guys that that's a, afferent and efferent are very general terms that are used in biology to describe something that's moving toward a central location or into a structure. And the term efferent refers to a pathway that's leaving a control structure or is leaving the structure that you're describing. So. In this video, we're going to really be focused on the brain as in terms of the central nervous system. But I wanted to introduce you to some terms associated with the peripheral nervous system. So you've got cranial and spinal nerves, and the uh, you can almost, uh, not almost, you can think of the central nervous system as the sort of black box. It's this computer, the central nervous system that's just sitting there, but it doesn't have any way to gather input. And without input, you can't have output. The peripheral nervous system is what provides the input in terms of the afferent pathways, right? And that would include nerves going into the central nervous system and even within the central nervous system we would describe as an afferent pathway the information as it moves from one area to the next within the brain carrying sensory information. The efferent nervous system, if, particularly if we're talking about voluntary thought and movement, originates with the brain, and sometimes with, if it's a reflex, simply the spinal cord. And we associate efferent with motor. So there are two different branches of the peripheral nervous system associated with movement. Those are the autonomic nervous system and the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, think automatic, it controls our involuntary responses. And it, in turn, is broken down into two opposing pathways. The sympathetic division, which we refer to as the fight or flight, or stress response, and that division of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic, Pro mobilizes and prepares our bodies to deal with emergencies. I, I think of this, I always describe it as getting ready for a bear, right? You see a bear in the woods and um, or something that uh, you realize is threatening and your sympathetic autonomic nervous system is activated. The parasympathetic division, on the other hand, is associated with conserving energy, and it's often described as sort of the rest and digest responses. So relaxation, literal digestion, right? Because if you're running away from the bear, you, you don't really need your digestive system to be functional at that point. The somatic peripheral nervous system involves control of voluntary 
movement and of skeletal muscle. So now what I'd like to do is show you this really interesting video about phantom limbs. It really illustrates why the nervous system is such an interesting system to study. Um, and it also reinforces some of the vocabulary that I was just talking about. The vast majority of people who've lost a limb can still feel it, not as a memory or vague shape, but in complete, lifelike detail. They can flex their phantom fingers and sometimes even feel the chafe of a watch band or the throb of an ingrown toenail. And astonishingly enough, occasionally, even people born without a limb can feel a phantom. So what causes phantom limb sensations? The accuracy of these apparitions suggests that we have a map of the body in our brains, and the fact that it's possible for someone who's never had a limb to feel one implies we are born with at least the beginnings of this map. But one thing sets the phantoms that appear after amputation apart from their flesh and blood predecessors. The vast majority of them are painful. To fully understand phantom limbs and phantom pain, we have to consider the entire pathway from limb to brain. Our limbs are full of sensory neurons responsible for everything from the textures we feel with our fingertips to our understanding of where our bodies are in space. Neural pathways carry this sensory input through the spinal cord and up to the brain. Since so much of this path lies outside the limb itself, most of it remains behind after an amputation. But the loss of a limb alters the way signals travel at every step of the pathway. At the site of an amputation, severed nerve endings can thicken and become more sensitive, transmitting distress signals even in response to mild pressure. Under normal circumstances, these signals would be curtailed in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. For reasons we don't fully understand, after an amputation, there is a loss of this inhibitory control in the dorsal horn, and signals can intensify. Once they pass through the spinal cord, sensory signals reach the brain. There, the somatosensory cortex processes them. The entire body is mapped in this cortex. Sensitive body parts with many nerve endings, like the lips and hands, are represented by the largest areas. The cortical homunculus is a model of the human body with proportions based on the size of each body part's representation in the cortex. The amount of cortex devoted to a specific body part can grow or shrink based on how much sensory input the brain receives from that body part. For example, representation of the left hand is larger in violinists than in non-violinists. The brain also increases cortical representation when a body part is injured in order to heighten sensations that alert us to danger. This increased representation can lead to phantom pain. The cortical map is also most likely responsible for the feeling of body parts that are no longer there because they still have representation in the brain. Over time, this representation may shrink and the phantom limb may shrink with it. But phantom limb sensations don't necessarily disappear on their own. Treatment for phantom pain usually requires a combination of physical therapy, medications for pain management, prosthetics, and time. A technique called mirror box therapy can be very helpful in developing the range of motion and reducing pain in the phantom limb. The patient places the phantom limb into a box behind a mirror and the intact limb in front of the mirror. This tricks the brain into seeing the phantom rather than just feeling it. Scientists are developing virtual reality treatments that make the experience of mirror box therapy even more lifelike. Prosthetics can also create a similar effect. Many patients report pain primarily when they remove their prosthetics at night. And phantom limbs may in turn help patients conceptualize prosthetics as extensions of their bodies and manipulate them intuitively. There are still many questions about phantom limbs. We don't know why some amputees escape the pain typically associated with these apparitions, or why some don't have phantoms at all. And further research into phantom limbs 
isn't just applicable to the people who experience them. A deeper understanding of these apparitions will give us insight into the work our brains do every day to build the world as we perceive it. They're an important reminder that the realities we experience are in fact subjective. Have you ever wondered why humans hiccup, or what makes yawning contagious, or if it's bad to hold your pee? Check out this playlist to find the answers to all of these questions and more. And make sure to subscribe to our channel for new fact-filled animations each week. All right, so again, central nervous system, it includes the brain and the spinal cord. Um, it is um, a privileged location immunologically and physically within the body. The central nervous system exists in two body cavities, both of which are considered to be within a larger body cavity called the dorsal cavity. The brain sits inside the cranial cavity and the spinal cord sits within the spinal or vertebral cavity. It's important to remember that both the cranial and spinal cavities are nested within the dorsal cavity. So if you're asked a question like, um, name two cavities that the brain sits in, it would be cranial and dorsal. Now I want to remind you about planes of section. Um, this is going to be important because we're going to be looking at sections through both the spinal cord and the brain in order for you to learn some of the interior structures. So the tran transverse sections are essentially cross sections. Transverse sections have the smallest footprint, so the smallest area. Um, if things are scaled at the same size, which they're not in these images. Frontal sections, which can also be called coronal sections, cut the body from front to back or vice versa. And these are usually the easiest ones for folks to recognize because most of us have drawn people with the head and shoulders sort of like this. Sagittal sections cut the body left to right or right to left. Uh, this is a mid-sagittal section, which is right along the midline, and it allows you to most clearly see many of the structures in the brain. Unfortunately, some you can't see in this in a mid-sagittal section, so you would need to look at a, what's referred to as a parasagittal or almost sagittal section. By the way, uh, I forgot to mention here, this is the front of the body, eyeballs and nose, and this is the occipital region in the back of the head. Look at sections through the nervous system. Right, this is a transverse section through the brain. This is anterior, and this is posterior. What we can see is that there are two different colors or tones of color in the brain. We have what is referred to as gray matter, which is how it looks when you look at um, a brain that hasn't been preserved and hasn't been sitting around for a while. And the gray matter is made of the cell bodies of neurons as well as unmyelinated fibers. So that would include dendrites and short axons that are within the central nervous system. And in this image, the gray matter is more brown in color. So sort of, that's the gray. Next we have white matter. And white matter is white because lipids are white. Um, in this image, the white matter is more sort of a cream color. And you can see that the, um, when you, you look at the 
brain this way, that the cell bodies are on the outside, the outer part of the brain, and the white matter, the bundles of uh, axons, myelinated axons, which remember are called tracks. Those are on the interior of the brain. So I mentioned that the central nervous system is a really privileged location within the body. And there are four basic layers of protection. The first, the outermost, is bone, right? So the, um, the brain is protected by the bones of the skull, and the spinal cord is protected by our vertebrae, the bones of the, the spinal column. The next layer of protection um, is a set of three membranes that sit underneath the bone and atop the brain. These are called meninges. And I'm going to describe those in a little more detail for you in a second. The third is a set of strangely shaped fluid-filled bags in the center of the brain that are full of cerebrospinal fluid, often called CSF. Um, everything in this image that is blue is filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So you can see that the, the meninges, those three layers of membranes, are um, essentially soaked and floating in cerebrospinal fluid. Um, one of my neuroanatomy professors once described the brain as a, a cabbage in a bucket, um, which is a little crude, but it makes the point that, um, which I think you can see in this image, that the brain is, is floating in the skull, in cerebrospinal fluid. Um, that fluid absorbs blows, a shock waves associated with blows to the head. But it also means that it's very easy to have damage um, when you have severe blows to the head um, because there is nothing that's lit, there's, there's nothing anchoring the brain in place in the same way that you have ligaments anchoring bones to one another. Last we have the blood-brain barrier. I'm going to talk more about that in just a second. All right, so cerebrospinal fluid and the ventricles. Um, remember from our discussion of glia that in the central nervous system, the ependymal cells, the glial cells, line the surface of the brain and the surface of the interior of the ventricles and they actually produce cerebrospinal fluid. So, as I said, cerebrospinal fluid is found between the meninges within the ventricles, these fluid-filled chambers, and in the central canal of the spinal cord. You can also, by the way, really see this is a frontal section through the brain, right? We've got a lateral view of the brain here, and if we take a cut right through here and flip the brain forward so that we can look at the cut edge, we see this image. In this GIF, you can really see that the brain is sitting in a closed container full of fluid, and you can see the fluid moving along with the arterial pulse in this person's brain. All right, in this slide, we're looking at uh, the meninges. I said there before there are three layers of membrane. Um, and in the illustrated area on the left of the slide, we've got uh, the skin on top of the head, an aponeurosis, which is a sheet of connective tissue. And the aponeurosis anchors the skin to the connective tissue that's embedded in the surface of bone called periosteum. And underneath the bone is where we see the meninges. We have the dura mater, the arachnoid mater, 
and the pia mater. And in this dissected view, you can see all of those same layers. But now we're looking at the, the head from the top down. So we have the skin of the scalp here. We have the aponeurosis here. We've got the periosteum associated with the bones of the skull. Then we have the dura mater. Dura mater is Latin for tough mother. And it really is a tough mother. It is um, very strong and very thick as far as membranes go. Directly beneath that, we have the arachnoid mater or spider-like mother. It got its name because it is uh, loose and sort of like a cobweb a dense cobweb, um, and cerebrospinal fluid circulates within the subarachnoid space. The pia mater, or tender mother, is the innermost meninges. Um, it's translucent, so it's see-through, and it is very closely associated with the surface of the brain and the spinal cord so much so that um, it's very difficult to dissect it away in unpreserved tissue without pulling off the uppermost or outermost layer of the brain. So we have bone, cerebrospinal fluid, meninges. The fourth layer of protection is referred to as the blood-brain barrier. And this is a cellular arrangement that acts to keep most molecules that you would find in the bloodstream out of the central nervous system. So we've got astrocytes. And remember, those are the CNS glial cells that are really nourishing to neurons. We've got astrocyte, we have a neuron, and we have a small blood vessel in the red. The blood-brain barrier is actually composed of the specialized membranes on the feet of, we refer to as the feet of these astrocytes, and the area of the blood vessel that they contact. So this arrangement allows for diffusion of steroid hormones, um, water, certain gases, obviously oxygen, carbon dioxide, but also um, nitric oxide, nitrous oxide. And there's active transport of specific monomers, glucose, which is the only fuel that neurons will use, and amino acids. The thing to remember is that this arrangement protects the brain from most bacterial and viral infections. All right, so that's how the central nervous system is protected. Now we're gonna move into the anatomical regions of the brain. And we're gonna talk about four different anatomical regions and two of the hundreds of different functional regions of the brain. So we're looking at a mid-sagittal section here of the brain. You can Hopefully you can pick out where the nose is. Um, there's the tongue. You can see the teeth. The largest area is called the cerebrum. Next we have the diencephalon. And diencephalon means second inner brain. The prefix di means two, n means inner, and cephal means brain or head. And we have the cerebellum, or little brain, which is the back of the head, directly under the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. And finally, the brain stem, which is continuous with the spinal cord. So in humans, the cerebrum is the 
largest portion of the brain. It's divided into four lobes that we'll talk about in the next video. It's the outermost layer. Um, and as you can see in this illustration, it um, has lots of wrinkles on it, um, which is an adaptation to increase surface area. The more developed the cerebrum is in a species, the more we as humans recognize that organism as being intelligent. The cerebrum communicates with and coordinates the activities of other parts of the brain. So the diencephalon, the cerebellum, the brainstem, spinal cord. When we look at the surface of the brain, um, we're looking at a top-down view of um, an autopsied, a brain that's being autopsied. Um, you can see they've cut a section out here. You can see the white matter and the gray matter, which is pink, uh, because of blood vessels. You can also really clearly see all of the wrinkles that, and grooves on the surface of the brain, of the cerebrum. When you have a very deep division, it's referred to as a fissure. And this one is the longitudinal fissure. A sulcus is a shallower groove, and the plural there is sulci. The gyrus is the area at the opposed to a sulcus. So it's the sort of the bump part. And the plural of gyrus is gyri. The cerebrum has two sides, which are referred to as hemispheres. Hemi means half. And you've got sphere, right? So um, two hemispheres and that groove in the set that goes from front to back in the cerebrum all the way down to the structure in red here, which is called the corpus callosum, is called the longitudinal fissure. The left and right hemispheres of the brain communicate with each other through the corpus callosum, which is red here. So this is a um, sagittal view of the brain, and this is a frontal view of the brain, or anterior view. So we're looking from the front toward the back. And the corpus callosum, which is Latin for tough body, is a huge bridge of myelinated axons. So next up, we are going to delve into the interior of the brain, and I'm going to introduce you in more detail to the parts of the cerebrum, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum.